As the adage says, you go to war with what you have. And whether today's U.S. Navy has the reserves in combat aircraft to engage in prolonged hostilities with a peer competitor in Asia remains to be tested. The Navy faced a similar predicament in 1942, when a late start in filling the pipeline with new aircraft and trained pilots, as well as new aircraft carriers, placed a nearly insurmountable strain on the pre-war fleet. This episode of Battle Stars shines a brief light on the Battle of the Coral Sea, the first battle in which the opposing fleets never sighted each other, and the first of four great carrier battles fought between the U.S. and Imperial Japanese navies in 1942. When credible intelligence indicated a Japanese move on Port Moresby, New Guinea and the Solomon Islands, endangering Australia in early May, Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, commanding the Pacific Fleet, could only counter with aircraft carriers Yorktown and Lexington. Of his other three carriers, Enterprise was escorting Hornet in the dubious endeavor to deliver the Army's Tokyo Raiders to Japan. And not for the last time, Saratoga had been torpedoed and was under repair. Rear Admiral Aubrey W. Fitch's Task Force 11, the Lexington Group, joined Rear Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher's Task Force 17, centered on Yorktown in the Coral Sea on the 1st of May. Flying combat aircraft from carriers is a difficult and dangerous business, and after nearly a week of preliminary operations, Fletcher's available aircraft had already been reduced from more than 140 to less than 125. The Japanese were indeed coming for Port Moresby. Vice Admiral Takeo Takagi had command of Operation MO's mobile striking force. The latter included Carrier Division 5, with about 125 aircraft embarked in carriers Shokaku and Zuakaku. Rear Admiral Chuichi Hara was both the Carrier Division and Air Operations Commander. The two forces might have come to blows on May 6th, but contact was precluded by poor communication, sketchy intelligence, and a variety of errors. Meanwhile, a separate invasion group that included the small carrier Shoho, a converted submarine tender carrying some 20 aircraft, plotted toward the objective. The expected carrier clash began inauspiciously on May 7th when Japanese search planes reported spotting one carrier and one cruiser. In response, Takagi launched a full strike of 78 planes against what proved to be the Euler Neo Show and destroyer Sims. Both succumbed to the onslaught and eventually sank. On the American side, owing to a pilot's coding error, Fletcher launched a full strike of 93 planes against not two carriers, as he was led to believe, but only the hapless Shoho. The attack force obliterated the carrier. A Lexington pilot radioed the immortal phrase, scratch one flat top. Three planes didn't return from the strike. To redeem the day, a Japanese effort to find and hit the American carriers with 27 unescorted dive and torpedo bombers in the early evening backfired when a third of the group was shot down by Wildcats. Two of Fletcher's prized fighters went down. Admiral Chuichihara's decision to turn on his carrier's lights at night saved the others from ditching in the dark. Meanwhile, operating from a position of strength and supreme confidence, higher command put the invasion on hold while the carrier forces battled. The opposing groups finally found each other the next morning, on the 8th of May. Fletcher had 118 operational aircraft. His strike group of 75 aircraft numbered 18 fewer planes than the group launched only the day before, when elements of the U.S. strike group began to arrive on target several minutes before 1100, cloud cover hid Zuikaku, so that the full force of the American attack fell on Shikaku. Dive bombers made three direct hits that wrecked the flight deck and knocked the carrier out of the battle. Admiral Chuichi Hara had mustered 69 planes for his strike. Picked up by radar at 10.55 hours, the Japanese group battled through defending aircraft to execute a well-coordinated attack. Yorktown maneuvered radically to evade torpedoes, but one hit and two near misses from bombs caused serious damage to the flagship. The larger and less nimble Lexington was struck by several bombs and two torpedoes, causing serious damage below. 27 more Japanese aircraft were lost. Fletcher had lost 19 planes outright. Many others had returned too badly shot up to fly. Lexington had developed a list that was quickly corrected, 
and the old warrior was soon making 24 knots and recovering aircraft. However, her apparent survival was rapidly undone in the early afternoon by a series of internal fires and explosions. When her burning hulk was sunk by friendly torpedoes, she took 36 aircraft, a quarter of Fletcher's original strength, down with her. Only 18 of more than 70 aircraft from Lexington's original complement survived on board Yorktown. On May 9th, after only two days of carrier combat, the combined air groups of two large Japanese and two large U.S. carriers had each been slashed by some 70%. Each Navy had one carrier and only 39 operational aircraft on hand. Fletcher had only 13 Wildcats left to defend damaged Yorktown. For a variety of reasons, including the availability of fuel, as well as the uncertainty produced by unreliable tactical intelligence, both sides called it quits. The lack of working aircraft stood at the heart of their decisions. The Japanese Navy won the tactical victory when Lexington sank, but the U.S. Navy claimed the strategic victory because the Japanese never did take Port Moresby. The U.S. Navy had also so thoroughly damaged Shokaku and savaged Zuikaku's air group that both carriers missed the Battle of Midway where air losses on both sides became much worse.